Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have top e-commerce expert and founder, Eric Tong is co-founder of Tech Armor, which is a leading manufacturer of mobile device accessories like phone chargers, glass screen protectors, protective cases, they have cables, they have so much more. Eric cut his teeth in business, rising to VP of the Asia Pacific region of Belkin over the course of 15 years, and he co-founded two previous companies. Tech Armor has sold over 7 million devices through leading e-commerce partners like Amazon, eBay, Newegg, and many more. And Eric, as I was doing research, I realized Tech Armor is a fraction of the price of these other retailers. I remember going into some cell phone store. I'm like, this is $40? This is crazy. And on top of it, you have an amazing lifetime product replacement warranty for all products. I haven't seen that anywhere. I remember, so I went to your website and I go and I clicked on why tech armor and there's just a big shield. It says it all, a big shield that says lifetime warranty. So first of all, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. Appreciate it. I want to dig into that a little bit, Eric. You know, I have so many questions, but the that's got to be a huge decision to stamp that on your product. So tell me about when you decided to do that and you and your co-founder, Joseph. Right, yeah. so my co-founder uh, and business partner, Joseph Giacconi and I decided that very much from the beginning. Um, our ethos of, of the company was to provide a great quality product at a great value price backed by great customer service. And when we started to figure out what needed to be pieces of that formula, it was li a lifetime warranty. Mm -hmm. And we believe that if so you knew that from the beginning, you were going to do, we were going to do a lifetime warranty. Right from the beginning. And it was, it was part of our DNA that um, we're going to provide peace of mind to our customers that when they purchase any tech armor product that, it's going to work as described and yeah. that we're there and have their back. So that was a big piece of, of our overall marketing message. Yeah. So where did you get the idea to do that? Because most people wouldn't start there. They would just go, okay, let's see if we can even sell this stuff. And you start with lifetime warranty. Yeah. Again, it, I think, Jeremy, it, it wasn't any one sort of vision that said, hey, we need to do this. It was, again, when, when we really dug deep into what we were, what Tech Armor was all about. Mm -hmm. um, we really stuck to the ethos that we were going to have a great customer service and provide a great customer experience for all of our customers. So giving them the confidence to, uh, to purchase Tech Armor products um, really kind of drove the tech, the tech armor replacement lifetime warranty. Yeah. I asked, cause I didn't know if you saw some, something at Belkin that you're like, Oh, this is, you know, this is, I need to incorporate this in my future company or, or whatever it was. Well, when, at the time when I worked at Belkin, we did have lifetime warranties on, on cables and mm -hmm. surge protection and things like that. Um, but screen protectors, uh, which is what we started with, mm -hmm. you know, are, are products that have a lot of wear and tear, unlike like cables, which are more static. And right. No one's like dropping just, cables. Yeah. Right, sit there. So there was uh, some, some, risk there you know in yeah. terms of managing the costs associated with sure. the more such as that but we find that you know customers when they actually do request a replacement and they actually get it they're like wow mm -hmm. we actually it works it, it was it was there weren't any hassles we got the replacement right. and we believe that that allows us to keep us you know the customer for lifetime yeah and and you know from a customer standpoint i see that and i think why would i buy a product from anywhere else but from a founder perspective, I think that scares me. I'm worried, are people gonna abuse this? What were some of the worries through your head and then how do you manage that, that risk for someone who's thinking about doing a lifetime warranty? Well, absolutely, the risk and, and the concern that kept me up overnight was how many people are gonna try to abuse this and right. how many people are gonna wind up having screen protectors for their aunts, cousins, you know, and, and siblings. Yeah. And so, you know, 
we we like to think that people are are, are have the best of intentions and that yeah. um, that they're legitimately requesting replacements for damaged product or that they cracked the screen or what yeah. have you. Um, but what we did was we we did set up an internal process where we're able to see if a customer is requesting replacements two, three, four, five times. Once you get to a certain amount, then you start to kind of dive deeper and and, and put in more. Uh, rigor, if you will, with that particular customer. But for the most part, uh, you know, people aren't abusing it. They're, 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 you know, again, we're bringing in good value price. It's not like we're selling right. in traditional brick and mortar retailers like yeah. Best Buy, where light products are three times the amount. So yeah. for seven to twelve dollars, they're buying a screen protector. It's, it's not like you know they're trying to to beat the system. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, because that. I guess from maybe keeping awake at night in the beginning before you launch it to actually implementing it, people aren't abusing it. It doesn't really come up uh, that much. Like people, there aren't any no, nightmare stories as far as that goes. It's more of an anomaly, yeah. Jeremy. We do have a, a couple of incidents, but it, it's really a minor uh, headache for us. Yeah. So Eric, you know, in the beginning of the interview, I had questions about boosting sales, big mistakes. But what I found with my research is you really focus on product quality and customer service. So, you know, going back to the lifetime warranty, you have to really start at the foundation and build an amazing product or people are going to obviously return it. Can you talk about your process for ensuring product quality? Absolutely. And the history is that Joe and I both have a lot of experience launching really literally thousands of products over the life of, of our career. Yeah. And so um, it starts out by by establishing a strategic partnership with our suppliers. I mm -hmm. mean, we don't try not to think of it as a vendor customer relationship, but more of a partnership. And mm -hmm. I think that that has proved uh, to be you know very successful for us because we've We've, the people that we've worked with from the beginning are still working with us today. Yeah. And, um, you know, sussing that out and vetting out uh, the suppliers and getting um, uh, product prototypes and testing them very rigorously. And, you know, we did a lot of uh, research where we were talking to people and giving samples out and having people test it and watching them and videotaping them and watching how they use the product yeah. and that formed some opinions on how we should design the product how the instructions or installation videos should be written or created yeah. um, so these are some of the pieces but that's powerful yeah watching someone use it is another another story exactly I, i'm a really we are really big on consumer insights understanding how people use yeah. the products and 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 tailoring that uh, experience based on what people's uh, needs are or, or even unarticulated needs, for example. But, you know, getting back to your question, you know, really focusing in on, on ensuring we have a great strategic partnership, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that the design and the user experience. So, you know, you hear a lot about out of box experience. So from the time that a person opens the box, right. how easy is it? You know, is it is it one of those we've all had experiences with those clamshells where you have to cut it <laughs> it's and horrible. Just cut yourself and yeah. leave. You know, making yeah. the whole process really, really easy yeah. all the way to, you know, and hopefully it doesn't happen. But if you need to contact Tech Armor, we're there to support you. Right. And yeah. so, you know, we have an average response time of around an hour and a half to get back to customers. These are just you know, pieces of ensuring that that quality is there from from start to finish. Yeah, yeah. I want to get to the customer serve or the customer um, service piece in a second, but sticking on the um, the process for product quality, the supplier. When you early on, obviously you started the company. What was your process? How did you know or find the the right supplier for you? Well, I talked to a lot of uh, colleagues in the industry since I worked in that industry for mm -hmm. quite some time and got a couple of leads. And then we made a trip to uh, Asia. Yeah. Tell me about that trip. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've been to Asia quite many times. I've lived in Asia. So for me, it's 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 quite easy. But got, getting there and spending time with around four or five different um, suppliers and, mm -hmm. you know, looking at what their processes are, you know, how, mm -hmm. how much uh, stress and importance do they put on quality themselves mm -hmm. and, you know, going through their audits and, and quality pr control procedures, et cetera, were really critical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you wouldn't think of it, but 
for screen protector uh, manufacturers, they, there's really like a dust room, right? So they can't have dust coming in because it'll affect, mm. you know, the, the quality of the screen protectors that get underneath and the right. adhesive gets on. So literally sort of like those Intel commercials, we had to put on like those suits to mm. go in there and, right. you know, <laughs> make sure that we were sterile and all that good stuff. But, uh, you know, that was some of the assessment. And then really about it, it's a, it comes down to rapport and communications as well. You know, mm -hmm. of course, there are other pieces of the puzzle like pricing and things like that. But in terms of assessing quality, um, it, it was it was really understanding their manufacturing philosophies mm -hmm. as well as, I think, communication, quite frankly, because you're dealing with, um, you know, Chinese vendors or Asian vendors and making sure that you feel you know, there's chemistry and that you'll be able to get your message across and vice versa. Yeah. So you go from supplier, then you get a bunch of the products, you test them. What was one of the products you remember testing and what you discovered? I'm, I'm sorry, Jim. What was one of the products you remember getting, you know, you got all these products and you're testing to see, you know, uh, maybe giving them to customers. What did you discover in one of those processes that helped you in the, the end product? Yeah, I think I think one of the things is that, you know we originally started out with uh, plastic PET screen protectors, mm -hmm. and so uh, they're a bit hard for some people to apply because you know you need to have a steady hand and line it up, etc. So um, you know we found like for the iPhone uh, uh, five, for example, yeah. that a lot of people were uh, installing it from the top to the bottom, and we thought that as we were installing it, that that was very difficult and that at the bottom, it was a more natural place to start because of the home button on the bottom mm -hmm. and lining that up was a lot easier. So going, just literally going through the installation and experience yourself mm -hmm. and watching others, you know, there were some of those kinds of insights that we saw. Another one was um, we saw that uh, a lot of screen protectors only had one sort of uh, protective layer that you peel off so you peel it off and yeah. then you apply it right we 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 kind of saw that there was a need for a second one so after you install it and you push out the bubbles it'd be nice to be able to peel off the second layer on top mm. so that it was pristine whereas when people were yeah um, there thumbs layer, all over it and thumbs and and, yeah. and scratches even so that was again these are just little insights yeah um, that we discovered over the process that's really interesting and then does that make it more difficult for you to manufacture? Because now instead of, you know, you can't just say, oh, I want a sticker. Now you want two separate things on there. How much you know, more difficult is that? It, it's not that much it's more not difficult. That bad. These guys are, are very sophisticated okay. and putting that in, into the process, you know, hasn't been difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, from the product quality, you spent a lot of time on that, obviously testing it, you know, find the right supplier in the beginning and then testing it with users yourselves and then, you know, coming out obviously with it. Um, and we'll go through some of that when we talk about the tech armor story, but I want to go to the customer review, uh, customer service side of things. Cause I was looking on Amazon and you've like tens of thousands of reviews. One of these products, like iPhone five had like 18,188 reviews as of today. First of all, how do you even keep track? Cause it seems like you, like you said, you respond within an hour and a half response times. How do you even keep track of when you're selling millions of these devices? Well, we, that is really what keeps us at the pulse of what the customers are thinking of. Yeah. So we, when I was saying the hour and a half, that's for customer emails that are coming mm -hmm. through for reviews. We literally look, um, and I used to look at every single one. Now I look at them, you know, every once in a while. But we have uh, a team of folks that are reviewing those um, every day, mm -hmm. and so within 24 hours, we're able to respond to any negative reviews. So those uh, negative reviews are provided comments back saying, you know, we we do have a lifetime replacement warranty contact us back or if there was a, a little issue that they had we provide an anecdotal tip or we right, provide right. a link to a video to help them things like that but that uh is stored um all this data is stored for us so that we're able to kind of filter through them uh, in, during our weekly meetings to kind of see if there are any insights into experiences uh, that can be improved upon. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we're constantly looking at that, and that again, that that's really the pulse. Because people, 
you know, they spend time to put in those reviews and it, it's a lot of those reviews, they're very passionate folks, right? Yeah. So a lot of times you can get a lot of good insight. Yeah. So what, um, for people who are thinking about, okay, I need to manage this process better. What kind of tools or softwares do you recommend uh, people look into uh, for reviews and, and customer feedback? Well, so for the overall customer service uh, engine, you know, we're using a platform called Freshdesk, which uh, allows us to, you know, open tickets, um, you know, and, and have a dashboard of KPIs that we can look at service level metrics and where we stand and how many times we're able to uh, solve a customer's problems on the first time versus two contacts, mm -hmm. versus three, et cetera, things like that to right. see how we can improve, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things. But in terms of, of scraping uh, all those reviews, we, we literally have uh, people that are... <laughs> that it's are like the software is called people. <laughs> yes, yes it is. I wish... I wish there are some some software tools that exist, and we're actually uh, vetting those out right now. But uh -huh. you know, even though that that one that you're referencing has eighteen thousand reviews, I mean, it comes down to you know maybe there's twenty a day or, or you know fifteen a day, and we're kind of looking at the ones that are negative and positive because sometimes the positive ones um, also you could glean some good insight as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me about the people side of it. You know, you have. I think I read. I'm not this. This is up to current, but 18 staff total. Yeah, we have, we have close to 20. 20. We have we actually have 10 here in in the states, and then um, we have a an outsourcing team that we're partnered with, and there's about 10 folks there. Um, so we we you know again to speak to our customer service, we over index in terms of human resources. So right. literally two thirds of the company is dedicated towards customer service. So we have a customer service manager mm. um, and another uh, customer service representative here in LA. And then they help manage the team of people um, that we've outsourced. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, it's that team of like 12, 13 folks that are, you know, making sure that our customers are taken care of. I mean, and Eric, since you are so customer service focused, you obviously want to bring in really good people who are also customer service focused. What's your process for hiring? So for hiring, not only for people that we're hiring as a full-time employee at Tech Armor, but also for uh, our customer service outsourcing partners, we do go through an interview process. Yeah. So um, making sure we understand, and, and we one of the questions we ask them is, you know, give us an ex give us an example of of an experience that you had, whether it's you know buying something or. Uh, having problems with your cable TV or phone service or what have you, anything that resonates with you where you had a really bad experience and then what was a really good experience. And I think by asking those kinds of questions, it opens them up, gets them relaxed, and you can kind of look and, and, and get a feel for what uh, their philosophy is behind that. And mm. so having um, agents that really uh, will, will live and die by customer service and, and, and understand the, its importance is, is a real key criteria for us. Um, the other things that we do is we, we actually will give them sort of as a survey or questions and ask them to type out responses right there, you know, in the interview. And that gives us a good gauge of, you know, what kind of tone they use and things like that. Of course, some of that could be trainable because mm. tech armor um, has its own brand voice if you will right. but getting a sense of how they deal with that um, gives us good good visibility to how they would might deal with it if we were to employ them yeah yeah I, mean, I remember reading on i think it was forbes and it references a martini story yes what happened there's a great story about the about martini so basically uh, jo Joe, my business partner, um, at the time, I'll just go back a little bit, is, is in the very beginning, Joe and I would trade off doing the customer service because it became really, really tedious and, and, and <laughs> required a lot of energy. So it happened to be Joe's turn that day or that week and somebody had written a review and he got up in the morning and, and started to read it and it talked about how, um, you know, this person 
had had a uh, martini and thought that uh, he did a great job with you know installing the perfect screen protector. Everything was great, and and then he realized at the end that it was installed incorrectly and upside down, and that he referenced the martini. And uh, the next thing you know, Joe responded back and said, you know. That was a classic story. Just, uh, you know, I prefer Bombay personally, but let me send you a free replacement as part of our lifetime warranty. Sent that, and then it became like this viral thing where everybody read Joe's review, the the guy that wrote this story, etc. And I haven't looked recently, Jeremy, but that that review still lives today where people will comment on it and says, Oh, because of that, I'm, I'm going to, because of this story, I'm going to buy the tech on the screen. Funny. So it has something like over a hundred comments over, you know, two years right. of history. Um, but that I think really seals it, right? It's, it yeah. epitomizes what uh, our, our belief is for customer service. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not only don't drink and drive, but don't drink and put your screen protector Thanks. on or something like that. Um, so back to a quick win, um, and we'll get into some of the, you know, the tech armor story, but for sellers, what's a must for some, some quick tips for boosting sales and some mistakes to avoid? In terms of boosting sales, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think making sure that you have your customer service intact. I think a lot of sellers kind of underestimate the, its importance and they don't take it serious and don't have the processes or resources in place behind the scenes to ensure yeah. that that's um, happening in a quality fashion. So that is one of the things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Tech Armor is selling primarily on, on marketplaces, so right. the listings are really key. So having real quality images, mm. having great titles, and yeah. having really great descriptions that are very succinct. You'll see some people try to put descriptions in that are really, really wordy and people wind up not reading it. So I think the listings are very key. Um, getting the word out there. So uh, there's no magic formula. It depends on the type of product, the category, mm. the audience. But a combination of advertising vehicles from Google AdWords to Google PLA to Amazon uh, sponsored ads, things like that mm -hmm. uh, are really important. I mean, um, you guys do a, get a huge amount of publicity. When I was doing research, like you've been on Forbes, Huffington Post, Business Insider, all of those. Is there a process that you have for reaching out or you know, that would be helpful for people to, to think about? Yeah, so in, in the beginning, we didn't have a PR firm, but we were fortunate enough to build a, a very strategic relationship with Amazon as we started to grow. And yeah. we uh, were introduced to the Amazon Marketplace PR team, mm. and uh, they helped us uh, and, and, you know, bring some of these leads in. And, you know, I think we do well with interviews, so they trusted us and, uh, you know, provided good insight into yeah. the Amazon experience. But outside of that... Um, we, we, we were reaching out to uh, various press, you know, journalists as well as uh, bloggers and things like that. And then as we got bigger, we hired a PR firm um, to kind of help us along that. But in the beginning, I think it's, it's trying to figure out, you know, who, who are real key folks that are leaders in the industry that you want to talk to mm -hmm. and create, a, create a, an inspirational or a differentiated pitch, you know, yeah. if you if you go to them and talk about the same old thing, it's not going to resonate. So really figuring out and carving out a niche. And I think for us, it was sort of this model about bringing great quality at a, at a reduced or a fraction of a price mm -hmm. backed by great customer service. And I think once we started seeing volume and that we were driving success, that created more buzz or, or more interest around the tech armor story, if you mm -hmm. will. And so what about on the flip side, mistakes people should avoid in their e-commerce business? Yeah, you know, we, we've had a lot of different mistakes over, over the years. Um, fortunately, none were disastrous, um, but I think uh, forecasting and planning is, mm -hmm. is, is really key. And uh, when we first, uh, our, we started in, in June of 2012, and during that Christmas period, 
we were caught off guard. Um, you know, we didn't expect the volume to be there and, you know, we have a much better appreciation of the various marketplace engines now, but just to give you kind of, uh, uh, a benchmark. Yep. You know, when we started in June, we sold 89 pieces, and by uh, by the time uh, December rolled around, we sold 200,000 pieces. Holy crap! Yeah, it was. Are you serious, Jared? I'm serious. 89, Jared. just like 89, and then 89 units to 192,000 to be exact. Wow! So it was a That's crazy. crazy. Product. And so, right yeah. after Black Friday happened in November, we wound up having to expedite, uh, you know, product and manufacturing and bringing in stuff via airplanes and via FedEx. So we had, we got stuck with a lot of uh, (laughs) extra logistics expenses, as you can imagine. But it allowed us to stay in stock and and keep our relevance. So we understood even though it was going to, you know, create some hardship, um, both from from the workload as well as economically, you know, prove that to be the right move. And I think that is an, an area to try to avoid is try to plan that out a little bit better and and talk to selling on the That's platform amazing. and try to anticipate. Uh, how can you scale. really anticipate that though? I mean, how, what do you account for it from eighty nine to one hundred ninety two thousand? You know, because there's other people who probably started around that time and they didn't see that huge growth. How do you how do you explain that? I, I think it, it's hard to explain, Jeremy, but I think yeah. that part of it is the timing. So when we first – our first product that we launched was a Galaxy S3 yeah. screen protector. It yeah. just launched in, in the June timeframe or May timeframe. Mm-hmm. It's the very first product. So we started to uh, develop – a following around that and we were first mm-hmm. in search on Amazon for the Galaxy S3. Fortunately for us, in 2012, the iPhone um, 5 came out and so we were able to jump on that mm-hmm. and and be first to market. So one of the key attributes for us mm-hmm. uh, being successful was first to market. We had product because we were working with a great um, supplier that yeah. had good intelligence where we we're able to kind of with huge with a lot of data points kind of get to a, a 99% confidence that our screen protectors were going to fit. So we're first to market, um, you know, and we right from the beginning, we had inventory and, and when you're coming yeah. up first on search and you're able to stay in stock, yeah. you're going to win. We had an example where for cases for the iPhone five, we were first uh, in search but we didn't have the right inventory, so we wound up losing the velocity. And over time, I mean, it's still a good seller, yeah. but it isn't nearly as good because we didn't do as good of a job in terms of um, product inventory planning. Right. And so it almost seems surprising and shocking, but it's really not when you go back to, one, like you said, the fundamentals, find a good supplier. So you had a good supplier. And two, you guys are smart guys. You've been in the industry for a long time. It's not like you just jumped into it. You knew what products you were targeting and you saw these phones kind of coming out and you came out and you were one of the first ones to come out with the product. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Still a painful process with when you have to to fly in all these these parts last minute and everything like that. It is extremely painful. When we saw the bills coming in, we would cringe. But I, I will say, fortunately for us, the, the weight and the size of our, of our typical product is quite small. So yeah. the costs aren't astronomical. It's not like we're selling uh, – it wasn't like now where we sell power banks. That would just right. absolutely crush us. Right. That's a fantastic example, Eric. Uh, another one that you want to talk about uh, mistake-wise? I think – Customer service, we, we, we didn't, it, so again, going from 89 to 192,000 units, Joe and I were it. We oh, were wow. the guys responding to customers. And once we started to reach over 1,000 um, sale units or sales per day, and then even more so once we you know hit December, it was Joe and I trading off mm. on a daily basis the task of responding to inquiries, to reviews, et cetera. And it was at that point we said, hey, we need to move quick. We need to. We're at an inflection point where we need to, you know, spend the dollars to find a customer service yeah. 
uh, outsourcing team that we could work with. And, um, I, you know, in hindsight, it's 2020, but I really wish that I was thinking about that earlier on and that we had that in place. So it was, it was a lot smoother, but, you know, we tried to still keep those metrics in place, but it might've slipped from, you know, an hour or every two hours to uh, maybe four hours until we got that in place. Yeah. I mean, that's an impossible task. I mean, no one physical human can respond to thousands of those at one time, you know? Right. Um, so I want to go back to the beginning because I think a lot of these, the foundational insights and in your experience, it's not like you just jumped in out of college and start doing this. I mean, you have decades of experience with products, launching products. So I want to go back to those days, Eric. And um, a fun fact about you, um, which I didn't, wouldn't expect, is is your, what your wife would say is you like to wear hats and specifically Yankees. So tell me about where you're from and a big influence for you growing up. So I'm, I'm from New York. I originally grew up in Yonkers, New York, mm. which is literally just bordering the Bronx. So I grew up as a big Yankee fan, my dad was a huge Yankee fan. My dad actually uh, went to middle school and high school with Whitey Ford. Mm, um, yeah, sure. Pitcher. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I was going to games at an early age and, you know, just became a huge Yankees fan and basically a huge sports fan. And so, uh, you know, I, yeah, it's funny that my wife would say that because I, I probably have like 30, 40 different baseball type caps and, you know, not all Yankees, all the other favorite teams that I have, uh, but, you know, big sports fan. Yeah. And I think the thing that, to answer your second question, what really influenced me was that, you know, I, I played a lot of sports. I played a lot of team sports and I think that, you know, I, I know it's a, it's a, a saying that a lot of people have, but you know, by playing team sports and understanding what camaraderie and rapport was and leadership on the team and, mm -hmm. and things like that and people doing their, their, you know, end of the bargain or their role, their roles, that played a big influence in me with mm -hmm. business. I felt like I was, uh, had more of a competitive edge mm -hmm. by playing sports and by growing up in New York. I, I really think that uh, growing up in New York. Is it? What was it like growing up in Yonkers? Well, it, funny enough, there's a new show on uh, HBO. Oh. I'm plugging uh, David Simon's new show called Show Me a Hero, which is about Yonkers in oh. the mid-80s, which really? is when you know I was going to high school there. And it's um, it was tough. It was a tough town, uh, Yonkers. And I think uh, it helped shape and mold me to be, again, competitive and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a great place to grow up. And um, I, I'm still friends with a lot of folks you know, that still are, are back there in, in Yonkers or in Westchester. So, Eric, when you were in Yonkers, what did you want to do when you grew up? You know, I, I wanted to be a businessman. You did? Um, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, my dad uh, was in a restaurateur, so he mm -hmm. owned uh, multiple restaurants and takeouts. And That's a tough you know, business. It is a tough business. So I saw what he was going through where he worked, you know, 12 hour, 13 hour days and six days a week, only Mondays, you know, were his wow. days off. And I saw that and I, it, I admired it, uh, you know, everything that he was doing for the family. But I also realized, um, you know, that was really, really hard work. Um, mm -hmm. I actually thought that I wanted to uh, open up a restaurant, you know, cause I'm, I actually love cooking and, and right. I'm somewhat of a foodie as well. But, uh, you know, I always wanted to be a businessman, I think. Mm. Uh, you know, I started out uh, shoveling uh, neighbors' driveways and knocking on doors and saying, you know, would you like me to shovel your driveway and negotiating prices? And I'd come home and I'd be so sore and drink, you know, a nice cup of hot chocolate to warm me up. But I'd make like $100 or more when I was 13 years old. And I was like, oh, this is big money. This yeah. is big money. This is kind of cool. I could buy some more hats. <laughs> So what kind of restaurants did he have? Chinese. Okay. And Chinese. so did you ever work in the restaurants? Absolutely. Yeah, I worked so in So what kind of stuff did you do? Uh, so I would actually cook some of the stuff too. Mm. Uh, really? So basic stuff. I, I wouldn't cook any of the more complicated dishes, but things like fried rice were you know, super easy to make. I'd, I'd make the, uh, you know, dip the egg rolls in the frying, frying bin. Uh, Put the ribs in there, chop up the ribs, put them in the tin foil bag, etc. So you no know, wonder just, you love eating and cooking. You were doing it from an early age. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
So going back to, and you also have your MBA from Loyola. What um, what did you learn from getting your MBA? Well, I learned a lot. I learned a, a lot about uh, sort of anal- analyzing businesses and, and a lot of different theories, right? So at the time, uh, there were a lot of uh, theory-inspired um, classes that were occurring. And, mm-hmm. and just to give you some background, Jeremy, I... I moved from New York. I went to school in, in SUNY Albany, moved out to LA and went to Loyola Marymount. But I didn't have a lot of uh, working experience at the time to apply my learnings to these theories. So yeah. why did you go like to California, I, Eric? Because it's obviously uh, New York schools. Weather, weather. My Smart. sister, Smart. Lived, yeah. yeah, my sister lived in San Diego and I used to visit her in the summers and I fell in love with it. And I was like, you know what, let me go out there. I, I, you know, I could always come back after a couple of years of school and yeah. I never left. Um, but getting back to your question, I, I think that because I didn't have a lot of the uh, work experience to apply some of the learnings, uh, it, it, it was it was helpful, but it wasn't um, extremely helpful. So then in 2000, I want to say 2002 and to 2003, I went back and got um, an executive yeah. program at that. UCLA, UCLA Anderson program, uh, business school. Um, and that was really helpful because at that, after that, I had already had a number, you know, 10 years of experience yeah. and was able to apply a lot of my uh, learnings to the techniques that they were, um, you know, teaching. So doing it again, you may have not gone and gotten your MBA right after college. I don't think I would, you yeah. know, in hindsight. But again, I think it varies for each individual. Yeah. You know? So how did you end up at Belkin? So funny enough, uh, my uh, first boss at Belkin, Sean, uh, he had posted uh, a job posting on the Loyola Marymount, um, you know, alumni or, or newly graduated students. And I applied to that and I applied to, uh, here's another fun fact, I applied to Kiko Man, um, the soy sauce company, to be a product manager there mm. and for Belkin. And uh, it was a toss up because Kiko Man had, was a big brand and whatnot. Huge, yeah. Um, and I got accepted for both, um, mm. but I knew that IT was the wave of the future. And uh, more than anything, probably, was the was the crap that I would get from my friends if I became the Kiko Man soy sauce product. <laughs> so I opted to go with Belkin. <laughs> we probably wouldn't be talking today if you took that job, I bet. Probably. Different path. Um, yeah. So Belkin, what's the good and the bad of working at a big company? Well, the good at the time when I first joined Belkin, I think Belkin was doing you know around $20 million in revenue. So it was kind of a small company. Wow, I didn't realize. Yeah. I always picture it as being huge. Yeah, well, I mean, now it's, you know, a billion-plus uh, organization. Yeah. But at the time, it was a very entrepreneurial, very empowering, um, and, and high-accountable uh, type culture. And I think that um, really allowed me to be the person that I am today. Um, yeah. You know, people were given the opportunity to have an idea and go and try and execute it. Mm. And sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes it worked. It did work. But as long as you learn from the mistakes and and you know improved upon that in the next try, uh, it was it was embraced. Um, so that was the good thing. Um, the the bad thing was just that you know I, I had spent um, 17 years with Belkin, mm. and towards the end it was just it became a big company, and you know it was a lot of decisions that had to be made by committees or you know just just. Just the bureaucracy that comes with any big company, yeah. um, you know, that was probably the biggest challenge. And quite honestly, you know, at the time when I when I when I left the company, I just turned forty. I think I was going through a midlife crisis right. and recognized that if I don't try to do something now, I'm probably not going to have the energy, you know, to try to do something yeah. down the road. So yeah. it was really difficult, Jeremy, but I did it, and, and uh, you know, I never looked back. Yeah, I want to talk about that transition because it can't be easy, especially if you're somewhere for 17 years. But I think there's a lot to learn on, you know, when you look at a billion dollar company, how they come out with products and launch products and their design. Can you talk about one of the products that you you guys came out with that you, um, you know, either headed up 
and some of those consumer insights, design, R and D, what went into it? Absolutely. Uh, so you know, we started up uh, the innovation design group where we had industrial designers, mechanical engineers, and and uh, industrial. Uh, I mean, consumer insights researchers as yeah. well. And so one of the things um, that we had done at the time was we went into people's homes to kind of mm. see how they were installing a router. And at the time, Amazing, in, the early yeah. two, in the early 2000 um, period, you know, there were, uh, that's when 802.11b. I had Belkin. Started. Yeah, I had a Belkin. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we were going into people's homes, videotaping them, breaking it down, dissecting it. And what we found was that on average, when we, when we looked at um, the competitors' products, that there were, on average, I think 52 steps required to install a router. Hmm. And when I say steps, it would mean like push the CD tray door open, put the CD in it, you know, click this, everything. you know, yeah. everything to set it up from start to plug a cable in. And from that, we learned that, you know, people were making, you know, honest mistakes like plugging in the LAN cable in the wrong port. Hmm. So from... From this research, it allowed us to do a couple things, make things a lot easier for the consumer. So we would include a yellow cable and have a yellow port on the back of the router that said, plug the yellow cable mm. into the yellow port. You know, so that would eliminate Just that drop type that of, simple. of call. But more than anything, um, Jeremy, that we reduced the uh, steps from 52 to less than 20. And wow. that was super, super innovative uh, at the time. And, you know, now it's shocking the kind of things that people are doing including Belkin and yeah. making the product much much easier but I think that uh, was a great example how we really tried to understand the users needs and and again not only what they were telling us their needs were but their unarticulated needs you know and that's even that's when you get sort of a defining moment when you could get some of those kind of nuggets of yeah. information yeah Eric, this is fantastic stuff. So what did you do? What else did you learn from the router um, and launching the product? Uh, well, it, you know, it was it was all about education as well. At the time, Wi-Fi was really young and people were intimidated by technology. Yeah. So we tried to, to not use so much messaging of feeds and speeds, mm -hmm. you know, like 802.11x and you know 100 megabytes per second and distances of you know this and that so we tried to break it down from from feeds and speeds and just giving them what they wanted to know which was you know what the coverage was and what what the what the speed was and how easy it was to to install mm. and so that was probably uh, something that that we did at Belkin um, before others, you know, the competitors in the space were very technical. Mm -hmm. We were more of an accessories company. And so we took that approach of making the product easier um, versus again, being a more technical product. Yeah. Wow. That's such a good point. I did not expect you to say that at all. And it's like the copy of what you tell people, the messaging is, is so important. Yeah. Cause you know, think about it when you walk, you know, retail was, there wasn't really e-commerce at the time when, yeah. when, when routers launched, uh, it was very small at the time. So when people walk through the aisles, we always had that test of, you know, the, the six foot test. So when they're walking through, how do we get them to kind of stop and look at it? Mm -hmm. And then the sort of two foot test where they pick up the box and they look at it. And, you know, how do you really capture their attention and, and, and get it to resonate with them? Yeah. What about from, or from a leadership perspective? Because you were VP of the Asia Pacific region. What did you learn? What was an example of a leadership, you know, uh, moment that we should learn yeah, from? Yeah, you know, I had a, a lot of different leadership positions throughout uh, throughout Belkin, um, but I think that having a sh shared common goals across the different functional groups or departments was key. Right, a lot of organizations didn't. didn't people within the organization didn't know what the other people in the company were doing. Mm. So what, uh, what, one of the things I did when I was in Asia was, you know, whether it was finance, marketing, human resources, sales, product, et cetera, customer service, you know, what their, what their goals were and, and, and it would cascade down 
uh, to the employees, uh, from a manager and to the employees. And so everybody kind of knew that we're pulling from the same ore. Yeah. I think that was uh, one of the things that uh, really resonated with me and some things that we do, you know, here at Tech Armor, you know, so that everybody right. kind of is on the same page and knows that each person has a real piv- pivotal uh, role in the company. So what do you think, looking back at your Belkin days, what do you think helped you the most from your Belkin I, days to make this Tech Armor such a success? I, I think easily it was Belkin's entrepreneurial and um, results oriented sort of, you know philosophy and culture I mean hands down um, I, I cut my teeth there they, they gave me the bandwidth to, to explore things and and allow me to execute it and I mm-hmm. think that uh, due diligence required you know of course you never wanted to just shoot from the hip you know some of it was intuitive but you know you needed to be very thoughtful in in the research and analyzing things i think that was probably the biggest uh learning or or trait that i got out of belkin that you know i'm applying today um and with my past uh you know experiences as well so how do you bring that in to the company so that your culture is is similar because when i talk to founders that's tough for them. The culture seems to come up over and over. When it reaches a certain number of people, it's hard to maintain that that culture. Right. Well, I, you know, and again, we have we have about twenty people, but you know, ten that are working here in LA. Yeah. And uh, I think that really what we we strive for is is giving everybody a voice, and that we want every individual to challenge us. Joe and I constantly speak about the importance that you know people are are there to challenge our thinking well we cannot kind of rely on what's worked in the past and just have status quo mm-hmm. if we're going to keep scaling and we're going to keep growing yeah. we need that and i have to say you know one of the biggest challenges that we've had is to hire great people because it's always hard to find that but yeah. fortunately we've hired great people and and we've got people you know, our first get, uh, Peter, who we first hired, is still with us, and he continues to be a huge asset and continues to improve internal efficiencies and processes, and has been has been a huge asset for us. So, how do you bake in that voice? Because that is important. Is there like a certain time of the week that you want to hear feedback, or how is that baked in so that maybe funny, someone funny, listening could do that? Funny that you say that. Every every Wednesday. We ask each team member to provide a very quick uh, update, and it shouldn't take, you know, it shouldn't take more than a few minutes to read, and it shouldn't take really more than a few minutes to kind of create. Yeah. But it gives an update on the wins, on uh, you know what happened, any issues that they had, yeah. any any feedback that they need, and what are the priorities for the coming week. So that is, I guess, one one avenue in which they can mm-hmm. express that. But we also have team meetings on a weekly basis that uh, give everybody an opportunity to, you know, voice any concerns or issues that, that have come across their yeah, desk. Yeah. So Eric, so you, 17 years, you leave Belkin. What does that look like? Married kids? Like, is that a scary moment? Is, are you excited? What, what are you feeling at that time? Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, my wife, is, is also my best friend, right? And so she she understood that I needed this break, I needed this change, and mm-hmm. that I, you know I wasn't fulfilling that internal need of doing something great, mm-hmm. right? And so it was super super difficult because you know I spent I think twelve years in in L.A. with Belkin, and then five years in Hong Kong with Belkin, oh, wow. and to move back, um, you know. And, and not have uh, the financial support right. anymore of, of a company and a pay and a payroll that was super tough but yeah. the biggest thing that I said was for six months I'm not going to do anything and mm-hmm. and and literally like detox clean my head clear it out and try to come up with something so yeah. I have to say that the first day that I woke up when I after I had left Belkin and I handed in my phone the next day when I woke up I Kind of reached over to try to find my my phone at the time, and <laughs> there wasn't anything there. So, 
kind of dialing it back and getting into a little bit of relaxed mode yeah. was very, very difficult because I'm, I'm pretty hardwired. Right. But then, but then after a couple months, you know, it was kind of easy. And then after six months when I said, okay, now I'm going to get really serious and figure things out, it was kind of hard to turn it back on. So mm. it was kind of interesting, the dynamics of that. Uh, but, you know, I think all along I, I believed in, in myself. I had a good circle of, of friends and, and colleagues and mentors that kind of believed in me as well. And, you know, I had, I had a lot of good support, if you will, to kind of figure things out. And, and uh, I, I knew it would work out at the end, but I never imagined it would be uh, as successful as it is today. So what would you do next? So the six months is over. What do you decide to do? So I, I started a company called Style Tech. Um, and Jeremy, this, this company pivoted so many times, but I'll give you the short and abbreviated version. My original idea was that uh, mass customization is going to be really big, right? There's um, a, a growing appetite of consumers wanting to customize things um, and, and, and be able to get that easily and, and have access to it. And it, living in Asia and wearing spectacles like, like yourself and I, yeah. I realized that uh, for Asians, um, you know, everybody's face is unique. Their, you know, whether it's their nose, their cheekbones, et cetera, it's sort of like your, your thumbprint. And my idea originally was conceived that the Asian market is growing, especially in markets like China, et cetera, and fashion is really big. It would be great to create a brand that um, allowed us to capture uh, a scan of one's face mm. and be able to pinpoint exactly the spectacles that would fit you know, their face, gotcha. uh, yeah. their unique face. Um, so it started there and then that was really lofty, I think, and, and very cash intensive kind of a business because you're getting into, you know, selling eyewear and things like that. So then uh, we pivoted and the end product was we created an app where you could take uh, a photo directly head on and on the sides and we create like a topography of one's mm. face. And we'd ask some questions in the beginning of your style preferences. So after getting that exact scan and, and, and shape of your head, excuse me, we're able to then provide rec a recommendation engine based on your style preferences. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing we did. A um, lot of uh, pros and cons, and or I should say, a lot of uh, you know peaks and 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 just a lot of challenges along the way. Uh, worked with some some brilliant folks uh, on the team, and you know we were able to exit the business, you know, and and do okay on it, but not not tremendously well. Then I moved on to another startup, which was called Hunuku, and Hunuku uh, means in the Maori language uh, family. And the idea behind this was that Facebook was huge, and and the way I see Facebook is that's very self serving. Uh, it's it's got immediate gratification um, and it wasn't very long lasting um, and so I believe that the family stories and and, and and everything that's happened in past generations helped define you as a mm -hmm. person yeah. so we created this uh, this software and this website that would essentially allow families to uh, capture memories of the past preserve memories of the present and inspire future generations. So for example, Jeremy, you can have uh, a niece that had uh, is graduating from college and you went there and your son went there and your parents went there and your brother, et cetera, and everybody could weigh in their stories via pictures, text stories, uh, audio, videos, et cetera, and it would be served up to you in a beautiful um, sort of Pinterest way where uh, you're able to discover all these great stories and the idea was that in the future your children's grandchildren can hear about your parents or your grandparents mm. immigrating into the US or a great food recipe that your grandmother has for whatever spaghetti and meatballs and, and you know what those key ingredients were and to right. hear that and keep it in, in the tradition. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that 
Ancestry.com is great because you get to learn about your, you know, the, your family tree and lineage, etc. But the stories are the ones that define you, and and that's kind of what the the embodiment of uh, Hunuku was. But mm -hmm. we ran into a small little problem, which was Facebook. <laughs> Everybody is on Facebook and didn't want to have to go and create a bunch of new stories and, and do all these things and right. we just couldn't get the uh, the funding etc but I learned I, I looked at, I looked back and I learned yeah. so much from that that it helped me you know moving forward so yeah. I, you know, failures are, are sometimes what you need to be successful going forward yeah I, I'm glad you talk about that because you know someone seeing you at the surface or the company like oh they just blew up out of nowhere you know, but the reality is you and your co-founder worked at big companies. You worked, you know, for 17 years. You had two previous, you know, company startups. And then we landed at Tech Armor. And so then how, what, uh, how does it, it come to be, Tech Armor? So, so interestingly enough, you know, Joe and I go back a long way. Actually, I, I had hired Joe, I think, in Belkin in 1996 or 1995. Mm. We became really great friends. He was one of the best uh, people that I hired and worked with. And so we had really good rapport. And um, ironically, Joe and I had left uh, Belkin at the same time mm. without really even knowing that we were going to do that. And uh, he went and did a bunch of different things on his own startups. I went and did my own thing. And we always, you know, remained great friends. And we started chatting up about, you know, we should do something together. We should do something together. And um, Joe had a lot of experience uh, selling big brands. He's more on the sales and marketing side and was selling a lot of different brands uh, and, and working with Amazon and eBay and, and other e-commerce marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, you know, I think that there's an opportunity to do something in that space if we could figure it out. And, you know, one of the things that really resonated with Joe and I was there was a video, and I, I wish I remembered the, the name of, uh, of the speaker on, on a TED Talk. But if you go to TED.com, it'll be easy to find. I'm going to check in, it out. Yeah, yeah type in Nokia uh, Researcher or something to that extent, and I'm sure it'll come up. But there was a talk about... Uh, this anthropology researcher who went all over the world to third world countries, to modern cities, etc., and did went into people's homes, observed how they, you know, how they lived life, etc. And there were three common themes uh, in terms of what people kept in their pocket, no matter where they were, and it was keys, money, and a phone if they had one, right? And and for most people, they had a phone. Mm. And when we heard that, it really somehow it just really hit us that, you know, mobility is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's one of the only categories uh, or segments where the CAGR is, you know, still double digit growth uh, on a global basis. And yeah. so that really resonated with us. And then there was another company, um, I'm not sure if you have heard of Warby Parker. Sure. Um, they're a New York based company, really a darling um, in the in the uh, VC world right now where they created uh, a brand of eyewear right. where you can um, try them on. They'll send you uh, five pairs to try on. You send them back. You know that they fit and then you order them and they sell for ninety five dollars with prescription. And as you know, since you wear glasses that, you know, they could cost anywhere from 200 to $500 oh, yeah. for a yeah. pair of glasses. Sure. And uh, what we loved about their model was that they essentially cut out the big box retailers and, and sold directly to consumers mm. and provided great customer service. So the combination of these things plus Joe and, and, and my experience in sort of the consumer electronics, accessory space, I think that triangulation you know got us to mm -hmm. say hey let's go for tech armor and 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 you know never look back since so you guys late nights you're you're collaborating you're discussing what do you decide to come out with first or what was that what did that process look like what were the options of what you were thinking about selling first yeah, so we looked at a lot of different things, and 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 it was it was all around mobile accessories, and we were thinking about cases or, or about charging products, uh, 
you know, and, and screen protectors for that matter. And what we recognized was a couple of things. One, the, the cost of screen protectors are quite cost effective, so it wouldn't require a lot of cash flow burn. Mm -hmm. um, it's also not as subjective as uh, cases are, right? So cases, you know, female, males, uh, young people, older right. people, everybody has different opinions. Too many styles. And too many and styles, too yeah. many colors, and, and too much of an inventory headache, right? Having yeah. skew proliferation and having to deal with so many different skews. So we decided that, hey, you know, I think screen protectors are a good space, and the Samsung Galaxy S3 is going to be launching in, in June of 2012. Let's start with that. And so we launched that along with the iPhone 4S uh, screen protectors and, and, and a couple other things. And it was at that moment, you know, uh, you know, we, we started the business. It really um, was focusing in on screen protection for those reasons and, and launching it to coincide with the Galaxy S3 launch. Yeah. And that's, well, that was that trajectory of 89 units to 192,000 units. It was, but I mean, it was, there was a lot more to it, of course, Jeremy, and, and it was a lot more product. I think we were blessed with the timing that the iPhone 5 just came out, mm -hmm. right? Because if it, if it happened to be the iPhone 5S, for example, the screen protectors for the 5 and the 5S and the 5C are the same. They didn't change the dimensions. Mm. So other players would have already had a year of history and yeah. views, would have been, but because it was a new platform and we were first to market and we provided a great quality product and the warranty, et cetera. It was kind of like the stars aligned and, right. you know, it, it goes without saying there was a lot of hard work but at the same time. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good luck and timing in there as well. Right. So what was the next product you decided to come out with? Uh, in terms of, well, in terms of screen protectors, it was, it was a constant, uh, you know, change over in terms of product. So we, I think the next one was the iPad uh, mini at the time, or actually the iPad. Um, and then supporting, you know, other Samsung products, mm -hmm. even Blackberry products at the time. Um, so from a screen protector, it was just providing different um, solutions for different hardware. Then we started getting into different uh, accessories. And, you know, the next thing that we did was, was cases, we started getting into uh, cables, uh, USB charging devices, power banks, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. cleaning solutions, you know, things like that um, to kind of round out our, our product mix and breadth. Yeah, I would think each would pose some challenges. At what point do you decide, okay, we got this screen protector thing. We need to find the next line, whether it was cases or cables or, or whatever it is. I think you know Joe and I have have enough experience where we realize that we can't we can't rely too much on any single product or any single customer. Mm -hmm. we need to have diversification, and we realized that pretty quickly. But you know we didn't start to even really think about it until after those first seven months, and and, and once we realized, hey, we've got something here. We sold almost two hundred thousand units in the month of December. We need to start preparing now, early in two thousand thirteen to ride that wave of the holidays of, of 2013. So it was early in 2013 where we started doing the planning around what new products to get yeah. into, et cetera. And, you know, that created our, our, our launch into different categories. Yeah. I mean, obviously, again, you have decades of experience with, with this research. What do you do to figure out, okay, now we need to go into chargers or, or whatever it is? Yeah, I, I will say uh, the beauty of having a company that is still small is that we could be very, very nimble and yeah. that we experiment with different things. Yeah. Um, so I think that the inflection point is, is, is such that, you know, things were working well with the screens. We had a good cadence going there that we had the bandwidth to start to uh, work on, on bringing in other products. And we started to assess the market. So what what categories can we bring the same um, kind of model to um, other than screen protectors and uh, looking at the competition, seeing what the landscape looks like, what, what the price points are and how they're differentiating and trying to plot that out um, on, on you know, various graphs and whatnot to figure out where we could be positioned mm -hmm. in terms of product positioning 
uh, it's at that point, once we do all that due diligence and figure that out, and, and you know, there's other things involved too. Again, like getting back to cash flow, like, you know, do we want to get into something that has a uh, $100 retail that requires a $20 cost of goods that's going to kind of, you know, burn up our cash flow versus, um, you know, more cost effective products. So, you know, we have sort of a criteria that we go through. We go through this due diligence and then we just go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's intuition as well. And sometimes it works extremely well, and sometimes you know it doesn't. It doesn't always work. Right. So, Eric, what was an experiment that that worked, and what was an experiment that did not work? So, an experiment that worked is is uh, getting into cables. We started to sell uh, cables, and I think that uh, you know the lightning cables, the connector for um, the Apple products was kind of newer and we were able to get out um, kind of early on with that product and that continues to be a huge success for us and during the holidays we sell you know tens of thousands of those um, monthly hmm. and uh, that's an example of something that worked out really well for us but an example of something that really hasn't worked out for us um, I guess from a product standpoint, uh, some of the charging products have been difficult for us to kind of crack because the price points are super, super competitive. It feels like some folks are just maybe importing them straight from China, not doing much from a packaging standpoint or user experience standpoint. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, folks in that space that are dominating and have lots of reviews. So that's been a little bit more challenging and we continue to sell, you know, a fair amount, but just hasn't really, you know, reached that or jumped over that chasm, if you yeah. will, you know, to a successful state today. Um, in terms of a non-product uh, for the audience to listen to, in terms of something that didn't work out was, you know, sometimes we try to expand too quickly and, mm. Now I'm talking less products, but geographically, mm, yeah. try to expand into uh, the European market. Um, you know, of course, we sell on Amazon uh, throughout Europe, so Italy, UK, France, Germany, Spain, etc. But we try to also expand via distribution. Mm. And I think when you work with distribution partners and they've got lots of different brands, and you may be a small piece and not an important piece. You know, you might not get the uh, passion that's required to make it successful. So that that's an example where, for the listeners, you know, make sure you do your due diligence. That you, there's really good synergy there. That the goals are in common. You know, if you're going to look for distribution partners, mm -hmm. um, that but that would be an example where, uh, you know, when we first tried, it wasn't successful. Now we're working with other distribution partners throughout the world and, and it is working quite well. Yeah. Cause I read that you, I think you sell in over 20 countries. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. What's some of the challenges selling internationally via e-commerce that people should well, think about? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, if you, there's, there's a lot of requirements, especially around that. So value added tax. Mm. Um, so if you're selling um, products in the UK and you then want to sell in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, etc., there's all these cross border VAT rules and compliance and regulations. So what we did was, you know, we said we don't really want to get into the market unless we're seriously uh, serious about it and committed to the process. Mm. So. We've now uh, created entities in, in each of those markets. Really? That we ship goods directly into uh, France, Germany, Italy, you know, UK, etc. And um, I think that that uh, in of itself has allowed us to provide a better experience because originally we were shipping into the UK and somebody from Italy might buy from the UK, but it might take a week to get there. And it's just not something that you're going to be able to Not good customer to service. Yeah, you're not going to scale that kind of a model. Mm. So um, I think for the listeners, that's that, you know, do your due diligence. If you're going to try to expand globally, there's a lot of compliance that needs to happen and there's a lot of companies out there that can help you with it. You know, I by no means claim I'm a subject matter expert. So partnering with uh, subject matter experts on these different topics are, are really critical. Yeah, because I could see there's a big opportunity, but I could also see there's probably a ton of unforeseen challenges that go with 
even expanding into the UK or anything else? Absolutely. And, and, you know, two new markets that we're expanding into right now is Mexico and India mm. via Amazon. And, you know, just all those requirements, like certain labeling requirements for our packaging, really? you know, et, et cetera, and, and getting that fine tuned, making sure that the importation of the goods go without a hitch, because if it gets caught or gets stuck in customs for whatever reason, it could take months before it gets cleared. So again, we, we teamed up with people on the ground in India and in Mexico that can give us great guidance and advise us along the way, you know, and, and, and make sure everything goes smoothly. So when you, sh when you, someone from Amazon India purchases, are they then sent, um, the product from because you're shipping it directly to India from a warehouse in India to them. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And then the directions, do they have all these languages on there? They, they, they not, well, they have the core languages on there. I mean, they won't have, you know, every language out there in the market, but, uh, for Mexico, of course, it'd be Spanish and English mm -hmm. for India. It would be just English. Um, but yes, we have trilingual packaging okay. for many of our markets. Yeah, I can see just there's a lot of a lot of details that go into this that without even, you know, thinking through it too much. There's, there's a lot there. Um, so what are you what do you consider the biggest milestones so far of the business, Eric? Uh, you know, I think I think the first one that really brings back memories is that when we hit a thousand units in a day, hmm. you know, that was a huge milestone. Uh, both Joe and I were in, in Hong Kong um, visiting some of our partners. And I remember, you know, it was, it was our morning uh, and nighttime over here in the U S and looking and seeing that we crossed the thousand threshold. That was kind of an awesome feeling yeah. moment. Uh, other milestones were, you know, with Amazon, we became a uh, managed, of uh, a managed customer, if you will. So in the, in the beginning, we were on Marketplace and doing everything on our own. And then we reached a certain threshold where we were assigned a, a uh, internal uh, contact that was managing our business. So mm. that really kind of helped us and helped us scale. Yeah. It was, it was uh, eBay. We became a platinum uh, seller. That was, that was another big milestone. And I think Going globally was another major milestone because we made the commitment from from a, a cash standpoint and and from uh, human resources to get the European business up and running and establishing the entity and all those good things. Those are just some of the yeah. milestones that we've had along the way. So, Eric, what is uh, some good advice that the the person from Amazon gave you who helped manage your account? Um, you know, oddly enough, they, they, they complimented us on how well we were doing things. I think that what it opened up the doors for us was giving, giving, getting access to do different promotions. Um, so, you know, if you, on the Amazon homepage, there are best deals and lightning deals, and mm -hmm. we never had any kind of exposure to that, um, mm. prior to this. I think that um, really helped us kind of scale the business as well. But I think more than anything, they said, really make sure that you're paying attention to your listings, that the quality of listings were strong, that uh, your your search terms are, are really, you know, key. So, mm -hmm. you know, doing your research and understanding what those things are, you know, those, those the, a lot of sage advice came out of those kind of conversations in the beginning, but, you know, now you go back and you think it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's done kind of automatic, so you don't think about it that much. But in the beginning, you know, them kind of telling us to make sure that we resolve customers' problems really quickly. You know, any A to Z claims that are there, kind of take care of them swiftly. Um, so I, I think it wasn't any one particular thing that was yeah. super insightful, Jeremy. It was just a combination of of things that they passed along to us that were best practices that allowed us to kind of implement across the, the company. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously you and Joe came together cause you have complementary skill sets. You like each other's people. What have you learned most from Joe in this journey with tech armor? I think, I think what makes Joe and I successful in this venture is that 
you know, we are, we do think a lot alike, um, but at the same time, um, we're different, right? So Joe is definitely more the sales marketing and he's, he tends to be a lot more aggressive than I am. I'm more the conservative person and, and kind of more the operational finance product on the back end. And I think that combination and, and the fact that we're good enough friends as well, where we, we, we don't let that get in the way where we, uh, we're very outspoken. We're able to challenge each other and, and, and really question if something doesn't feel right. right. Um, but I can't really think of any one example where we couldn't finally end up with, you know, an agreement on something. So I think, uh, you know, the, the chemistry is there. But in terms of maybe things about Joe and learn is that he's, he's, he continues to be very optimistic. So we go after things, mm-hmm. um, you know, sometimes that work out, sometimes that don't. But I think it's his optimism and, and, and spirit there that, you know, uh, is aggressive that keeps us on our toes and whatnot is probably the one thing that um, Joe's helped me. Yeah. How often are you releasing new products? Every month. Every month we're launching new products. Yeah, sometimes every week. But, you know, it coincides with a lot of the new devices that come out. So in the June to October period, there's a lot more. In the springtime, it kind of slows down a little bit. But on average, we've got something launching and a lot of times multiple products every month. Because you look so calm. I think if there was multiple products releasing every week or month, I wouldn't look so calm. Yeah, well, again, we're blessed that we've got great talent surrounding us where I think we've got a good cadence going with everything. But, uh, you know, uh, right now I'm very calm, but there are definitely (laughs) super stressed or get upset and whatnot. But, uh, you know, things are going well for us. What's the most stressful part of the business? Probably not knowing 100% with confidence that we nailed the product correctly, right? So, for example, the iPhone 6S is launching in September. You know, we've got pretty good certainty that that we've got the right dimensions, mm. but, you know, you just never know. And mm. it's, a, it's a risk you need to take to be first to market and to yeah. maintain your market leadership. But that's super stressful. Um, screen protector is less stressful, but, like, cases are very stressful because you got to create a tool and it costs thousands of dollars and, you know, you're making bets and that... Uh, keeps me up at night. The other thing would be just making sure our forecasting is right. Um, you know, trying to figure out last year how successful the iPhone 6 was going to be, how many people mm. were going to upgrade, making sure we had the right inventory. Of course, we didn't get it right. Um, you know, there were issues and we had to react. But I, I feel like each time we've, we're have we getting better and better because we have more historical sort of experiences and data that kind of help us forecast better. That's tough. Actually, because there's so many factors in that. So many factors, Jeremy, and 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 unknowns. And uh, you know, I like everybody else like predictability, <laughs> and it, it's very stressful when you're trying to figure out if if the tool is right and yeah. you should you know start shipping product, etc. Because you want to have the product, the accessories at the time of purchase. Yeah. So it's important that you have the products even before the product is announced. Yeah. So what are your top sellers? Uh, you know, we do very, very well with Apple products. So the iPhone six, um, the iPhone five, the iPad, iPad mini are very successful, uh, successful for us. Um, those are definitely our top sellers, but, um, the Samsung platform does very well with us. Uh, so the S five and the S six, some of the galaxy tabs, but even some of the other phones do, you know, and devices do really well for us. Uh, the Amazon Kindle, the LG, G4, um, you know, a lot of these uh, Motorola, Motorola Droid, um, a lot of different devices do well. But the biggest sellers are, are, are the iPhone 6. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know, you know, you, you speak and you've done um, speaking with the IRCE, which is one of the biggest retailer conferences. What did you speak on when you went? Uh, the importance of, of uh, your KPIs within Amazon. So how do you uh, ensure that you're, uh, you're 
meeting or exceeding the metrics and the importance of that. And yeah. so examples of that would be, you know, your merchant feedback. When I sell a product to you on Amazon, uh, they'll ask you to rate it and, and, you know, things like that, our ship time, our on delivery time, mm -hmm. the tracking, um, all those kinds of metrics and, and customer service. So, I mean, it was a big topic. There was a track for the whole day around Amazon and there were probably like eight or 10 different segments. And we had the one around customer service and, and mm -hmm. the importance of uh, supplier metrics. Yeah. I mean, some of the, I mean, there's probably thousands of people who have seen you speak and you probably talk to lots of other e-commerce professionals. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see people making? You know, again, to be repetitive, I think uh, a lot of people neglect the importance of customer service. They don't have the the tools, the people, the technology, whatever it is yeah. to, to provide that customer service. I mean, we all have ex experiences where, you know, something happens outside of, you know, the accessory space. Whether it's your 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 cable TV went down, your water is broken, whatever the case may be, how do people respond to that? Is the lasting impression that you have of, yeah. of brand and and one of the things, Jeremy, that we do that for you the listeners uh, might find interesting is that we uh, do a net promoter survey mm. on a continual basis, and for those that, that that may not know what that is, it's one simple question where you ask. Would you uh, would you refer or recommend Tech Armor? Or you could input any brand in there uh, to your friends, your family, or colleagues. And on a scale of one to ten, mm. uh, nine and ten are net promoters, seven and eight are neutral, and one to six are are net detractors. Mm. And you throw out the neutral um, because those are folks that are kind of just saying, ah, oh, seven or eight, you know. So you throw that out because it's kind of noise, if you will. And you take the uh, net promoters minus the net detractors, and that's your net promoter score. And it's a it's a research tool that was created by Bain um, that really kind of gives you predictability about what people think about your brand for the coming years and. Um, I think for us, it helps us kind of figure out what people are thinking about us. And, you know, it's a way to kind of, you know, engage with customers after they've, you know, bought the product, used the product, or even contacted our customer service. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, talking on that point, Eric, for a second, the um, software that's essential for your business. I know you talked about Fresh, Fresh Desk. Yes. What else do you, do you use that's essential? Uh, well, we, we, you know, it, we use as a company, we're using Outlook. Um, so that's one of the tools that we use that's, you know, and, and, and a, the Google suite of products that we use as well. Um, we're currently using uh, Channel Advisor, who is a uh, aggregator software um, that, that is helping us um, with, with the thousands of products and listings throughout different marketplaces in different countries. So that's another, you know, big piece of our, of, of our software tools. Um, I would say those are probably the primary tools that we're mm -hmm. using today. Is that, how do you manage all the inventory? Cause you have so many different channels you sell through. Yeah. So, uh, channel visor helps us a bit with that. Um, we actually use a lot of the different tools, you know, on Amazon, for example, to help us as well, because we have a lot of products in their FBA mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and by Amazon warehouses. Uh, but a lot of it is done through uh, the old fashioned um, spreadsheet. So we've got, you know, uh, spreadsheets that we put together on a weekly basis to kind of monitor, sell through what's coming in you know, and, and what our inventory levels are. And, and, you know, coming into this holiday period, this is the biggest challenging time for us to try to nail that um, because we're going to need to really bring in a lot of inventory over the next few months. Yeah. What do you, so if people are looking into like Fresh Desk and Channel Advisor, what are some of the limitations they should, you know, look at that would maybe halt, halt growth? Um, I think... You know how robust the engine is, right? I mean, a lot, some some of these other we so for example, we before Channel Advisor we use another um, platform, and there were some challenges, inherent challenges there, where it didn't scale as well, mm. required a lot more manual uh, interface 
with than, than Channel Advisor, for example. Um, before Freshdesk, we used another um, platform called Kayako, um, and it didn't provide uh, as much data points or reporting mm. um, things. And then, you know, one of the things that uh, Freshdesk allows us to do is that we could turn on a customer inquiry uh, switch, if you will, where after our agents close out a case, we could then send a customer, you know, how could, how did, what, what, how would you rate our service? What could we do better? Mm-hmm. And those things are help, help us yeah. um, in, in feeding, you know, what improvements we can have. Yeah. Eric, this has been hugely valuable. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about this throughout this whole process is about mentors and who are your mentors? and in the e-commerce world and what's some of the best advice they've given you so you know i i I don't have any particular one mentor i have a group that that of folks that i'm always in touch with Mm -hmm. always bouncing ideas off of they're entrepreneurs as well so they're contacting me with ideas and 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 asking for advice etc um, and you know, a number of them are, are, you know, folks that I used to work with at Belkin or, you know, in the past, the startups that I was working on. Uh, so there's a combination of folks that, that, uh, that I've worked with, but I think one of the most sage advice that I got that really resonates with me is however much, however much time you think it's going to take, double it. And however much money you think it's going to take, triple it. I think that. <laughs> Yeah. My experience with that has been pretty accurate that, you know, it always takes longer and it always costs more money. So really be yeah. thoughtful and don't, don't be serious when you're, you know, trying to plan things yeah. out because it, it, there's always going to be hiccups along the way. Yeah. I mean, and the money front, Eric, you know, digital products is one thing. Physical products, you have to put up all this money, get the inventory. How should people navigate that? Should you think they should look for outside funding? Should they fund it themselves? Should they try and go slow and then reinvest? What What's your philosophy on that? My philosophy is crawl, crawl, walk, and run. Definitely, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think that the beauty of being in the e-commerce world is that you can react pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, taking it slow doing things in a quality fashion. I, I'd rather do one or two things in a really high quality fashion than trying to be, you know, doing 10 things in a mediocre way. So I think it's really critical that you start off slow um, and build it over time. I think that to the extent that you can, definitely try to self-fund it um, because... Because yeah, yeah. you, know, you enjoy our boot, you self-funded it, right? We self-funded it, we bootstrapped it and, and never had to... Um, you know, go for outside for any investment or debt. And, you know, it's, it's fortunate. I mean, I, I, I think more often than not, it's more of an anomaly. Um, but it, to the extent that you can definitely, you know, invest and, and, and you're on your own and reinvest those profits back into the business. So uh, for a long time, Joe and I were just reinvesting in the business, not taking any pay, uh, yeah. you know, payroll out of the company until, until we were able to. Yeah. How do you decide when is the time to do that? Because there's always that that influx of inventory that you need. I know, I know, but you know, I think that uh, the again, the beauty of e-commerce is that we, and part of our strategy to only focus really on e-commerce is that we're able to um, get paid pretty quickly. Whereas if in the you know, when I was working in the retail industry in the past, working with Walmart or Best Buy, you know, et cetera, you're talking. 90, 120 days uh, uh, payment terms, sometimes consignment, right. things like that. So the fact that our business model kind of makes it work, for, you know, the cash is working for you. It, it, I guess the point in time when we saw that we had a stable enough business and that revenues were coming in quick enough and, you know, we, we had the opportunity to take money um, in, yeah. in terms of payroll and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So, Eric, I have one last question for you before I ask it. Where should people check you out? What websites should they uh, should we point people towards? Well, definitely go to you know www.techarmor.com. Um, you'll find all of our products there. You'll find uh, information about us as well, and and our and, and what our beliefs are and, and the mission statement of the company. Uh, you know, Amazon.com. 
uh, eBay.com, all of the major uh, merchants or marketplace out there, we're, we're selling in those markets as well. Yeah. Yeah. Check out the site for sure. And um, it's a lifetime warranty. It's amazing. Um, so last question, Eric, since it's the Scuban e-commerce mastery series, my question is, what are what should we leave people with? What are some best actionable tips for their e-commerce business? We talked about a lot of different things. We covered a lot of ground here. I think there's a number of things I'm going to share, but I think uh, be serious about customer service. You know, really make that the backbone of of who you are, because I think that if you do that well and customers remember that and it resonates with them, they're gonna. There's word of mouth. There's going to have that net promoter kind of uh, uh, effect, if you will. So really making sure that that's uh, there and that the support mechanisms are there for customer service. I think, again, be thoughtful you know, in whatever you do, whether it's a product or a service. Make sure that you're thoughtful about how people are going to use the products, what they want out of the product, how you deliver that. Um, I think it's it's really important that it's a well thought out and, and quality approach, not not sort of a ad hoc haphazard kind of a approach. I think it, it, it takes more time, but it, it it will reap greater rewards and, and greater results. Um, and then surround yourself with great people, whether you whether it's advisors or friends. If you don't have the capacity to hire people yet, or when you do are hiring people, you know. Whenever you have that question in your mind, should I go with uh, candidate A or B and candidate A costs $10,000 more, I should probably go with B, you'll regret that. You know, go with the best person, hire great talent, surround yourself with people that are, that are willing to challenge you and take you to that next level. I mm -hmm. think those three things would be, you know, key takeaways. Yeah. Eric, thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Same here, Jeremy. Thank you so much.